just go anyway? Yeah. What does everyone vote? Uh, go anyway? Should we just go anyway? One word at a time. All right. All right. To the most exciting panel show. Well, you're going to wait through this part. We'll wait for this part. It's part of our first day's alarm system. Please remain where you are. Presently, our response team is on our way to locate the source of the alarm. Carefully look for the immediate danger to yourself. Please wait for further instructions or one communication system. We apologize for any inconvenience. Your seat can be used as a flotation device. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Mark Sargent, who you're familiar with, of course, Jaron Campanella, Rob Skiba, and Bob Nordell. And what we're going to do when we're not being interrupted by a woman's voice and a dinging bell are uh, allowing you to ask some questions of these panelists. Maybe, you know, earlier when Mark was on yesterday, some people weren't able to ask, uh, ask him a question because we ran out of time, or maybe you haven't had a chance to ask the other gentlemen a question. All right, so I've got questions for the panelists, and they're each going to take a turn answering the questions. There will be four different questions. Then after that, we'll open up the floor, like we have in the previous Q&As, if you've got any question at all for anybody here. But first, let's just go with the questions I've got here on my phone. Uh, the first question, and we're just going to start from Mark and then move down the line. The first question is, what is your recommendation regarding how to explain flat earth to others, people who don't know about it, to friends, family, co-workers? What do you think, Mark? Ooh, wow. That's a good question. If I were to be approaching, and I'm sure a lot of you have done it, uh, flat earth to a first-timer, be it a friend, family, or co-worker, oh, boy, uh, First thing I would do is I would size them up, and I'm, I don't want to use the Fight Club reference. I would go after what some of these guys have done in the past, which is I would go after NASA first. I would find out where their belief system lied. And I know you're up here in Canada, but I would go after the American space program, more specifically Apollo. I would ask them point blank, do you think the Apollo missions happened? Do you think the Americans went to the moon? No, they didn't. But it, ask them, find out. Because if they believe wholeheartedly that the Americans did go to the moon, then you kind of know where to go from there. I, I never, ever recommend people go into like a family environment and say, oh, yeah, by the way, the Earth is flat. Try to warm them up to something first. That's just me. Mm -hmm. All right, good answer. <laughs> same, same question you said? Yeah, same question. How would you explain it to friends, family, people that don't know anything about it? I just think it depends on what kind of person you are. If you're, I see so many people doing activism that are out and able to talk to people on the street, and I think that that's fantastic. And I just watched a video last night of somebody standing on a boardwalk with a sign. Unbelievable. I mean, the amount of people that are, you're seeing or that are seeing that sign and asking questions. And uh, it's just that, you know, research flat earth or flat earth is that thing that makes anybody stop in their tracks and really... Uh, kind of pay attention. So it just depends if you're able to do that. I know that that's something that uh, some people wouldn't be able to do in a million years. So if you're that kind of person, then maybe doing what my wife did for a long time, which was she had little cut out pieces of paper, and any, everywhere she went, she would leave them, whether it was the bank or ATM or grocery store. So in this way, she didn't have to really talk to anybody, but she's still getting the word out. So I think it just comes down to uh, what kind of person you are. All right, um, Rob, what's your answer to the same questions? Family, friends, coworkers, strangers, what do you think is the best way to approach them to explain mm. the concept of flat earth? Well, right now I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. We start at 333 and the alarm goes off and we're all on stage, so I'm kind of thinking, <laughs> 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 if I was a conspiracy theorist, I'd be a little nervous right now. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't really, I don't consider myself a flat earth evangelist, so I'm not like out there, hey, guess what? But if it's something that it starts up in a conversation, same thing these guys said basically. Uh, as a public speaker, I'm trained to try as much as possible to understand my audience and relate to my audience, so kind of feel out where they are. And like Robbie says, I got to figure out where you are with 9/11 and, and the moon landings, because if you're on, on either of those pages, you know. But uh, the curvature math is a good one for me when I want to start the conversation and talk about it. Um, seeing things at a distance you're not supposed to be able to see, water bending atmosphere in the vacuum. Those are the kind of my three go-to starting points. All right, Bob, before she speaks again, <laughs> how would you answer the same question? 
you are now free to move about the country. <laughs> All right. Well, me personally, I uh, would take the advice of another well-known uh, Flat Earth YouTuber. And uh, when you, uh, you just don't talk about Flat Club, uh, pretty much. <laughs> so I would never start out uh, trying to talk directly about Flat Earth. Um, I usually will talk about something a lot easier, uh, a lot more common sense, like, you know, what happened on 9-11. Uh, I'll point out, you know, the free fall uh, speed of the buildings, you know, falling in 10.2 and 10.6 seconds respectively. Find out what they feel about that. If they're completely against it, um, then you're probably not going to get very far with uh, flat earth subject at all. So, uh, uh, it, but if they're open to it at that point, then I would start going into some of the things that we discussed on Globebusters yesterday. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much about it is... Uh, you know, feel them out first. Um, if they're not open to any other conspiracy, then it's probably not a good idea to talk about it. And, you know, it's kind of like what Morpheus said in the, in the Matrix movie. Uh, once people are past a certain point or age of indoctrination, it's dangerous to bring them out of the Matrix. Hmm? Good answer, good answer. All right, the next question is, and Mark, you're going to kick it off, and we're going to do the same thing. All right. With an interruption coming really soon, right? It's like a game soon? show, really. <laughs> Are there any personality traits that make a person more accepting of flat earth or less accepting of flat earth? Ooh. Uh, p traits that people have. Yeah, like if I was going to try to approach somebody who I thought, just, just off the cuff, if I was going to approach somebody that I thought might be receptive to flat earth, I might go after, I, it's probably a safe answer, but I'd go after an artistic person first, because artistic people, you can almost plot a graph on open-mindedness, and, you know, if they're creative, if they have a lot of cool little hobbies on the side, that's what I'd, I'd probably do. I'd probably go after an artistic person. All right, Jaron, you, you next, but you can answer what would be less likely or more. That's up to you. Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, I think that the education system has grooved people that are, uh, you know, yes-men, the people that um, don't buck the trend, that go by the rules, that... Uh, do any assignment, no matter how ridiculous it is. Those people went on to get good grades, went on to get college degrees, and um, are the kind of people that are going to be real tough to talk to because they are, uh, you know, they're so groomed to be exactly what the system wants. So, um, and then you know, people that uh, didn't have a not didn't have a college degree, but I mean, I went to college for like a month. So I think people like that that kind of. Um, saw school for what it really is, or you know, I may have not seen it completely at the time, but those people are open to it. They saw issues with the way we were brought up. They um, saw the issues with what we were taught in school and how that stuff just kind of went away and it wasn't important. So I think those people might be the best people to talk to. They can understand what we're trying to say. Okay, Rob, any personality traits that might make somebody more likely or less likely? Very much the same as what they've all said, uh, uh, right brain people. Mm. Uh, I tend to uh, gravitate towards, anyway, as a right brain person myself, uh, tend to be way more open to stuff. But when you're talking with an artist, I don't have to explain too much to them because they understand things like perspective and how things like that work uh, intuitively. So uh, those would be the type of people that I would immediately have an easy uh, conversation with, I think. And I'm going to make this easy and say exactly the same thing. Uh, <laughs> artistic, right brain type people, uh, creative people, uh, are much more open-minded, and uh, they think a lot more outside the box. Yes. So absolutely, those would be the type of people I would approach. All right, back to Mark Sargent for the third question. What do you think is the most important aspect of Flat Earth that we might need to concentrate on to get the word out as we move forward? And that could be experiments or um, you know, activism or more YouTube videos or... Well, what do you think? Yeah, and this is probably the only one we'll pro probably disagree on uh, because everyone's got their own, own take. But it, moving forward for me, anyway, is going to be trying to reach the top tier media as, as fast as possible. Uh, networks we haven't gotten to, prime time we haven't gotten to. I mean, we're, we're reaching out in you know, the documentary and things are happening in that arena, but I believe in... in you know, hitting as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And so, even when the media attention is negative, as we've seen in, in some aspects today, you still are of the mindset that... Uh, oh, yeah. No. I, it's, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather have the media come at us aggressively than ignore us. Uh, so that, that's my technique. 
All right. Same question to you, Jaron. What do you think is uh, the most important aspect of Flat Earth we need to get out there? Probably getting to, to be some kind of unit. I just think it's too segmented. And it's not something mm -hmm. I you know, intended or expected from the beginning. Um, you should be able to tell by now who's in this for real, who's not. And it's just something people can't pick up. They still think that people have been doing this for three years and making 300 videos and that they're doing it for some nefarious reason or that they don't believe what they're saying. So until we all can operate as um, at least, I mean, you know, Rob's a, a, a Christian and I'm not. We get along great. We sit next to each other at dinner. We talk all the time. So it, it, we have the common goal. We have common beliefs. We both you know, want the world to be a better place. So people need to recognize that. The science side recognizes it, which is really sad. They, they'll back each other up till no end. Um, even if they totally disagree, we just haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. What's been frustrating to me in any kind of a truther movement, I echo both what both Mark and Jaron said, uh, but in any truth movement, a lot of times what happens is when you start to realize everything's a conspiracy, or at least you get the, to the point where you think everything's a conspiracy, you start to think everything's a conspiracy. Everything. Yeah. You know, it was, we started at 333, see, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> you know, we must be Freemason shills. Um, I think the community needs to first look up the word shill and understand what it actually means. Um, and have some substance behind what you're, if you're going to accuse somebody of something, at least have something to back it up. Don't just make it up. I mean, the, the, what happens too often is it becomes a, an infighting situation and then nothing gets done. We're too busy pointing fingers at the other guy with no substance to prove anything, and you know we don't go anywhere. So I, I would say we need to get a lot more unified. And okay, fine, if we find some rock-solid thing that somebody did that's wrong, fine, maybe we should expose it. But otherwise, you know, why are we fighting each other? <laughs> We've got enough problems, you know. Yeah, look for look for the person's fruits. Really, I mean, it's it's fairly simple. And if people have been it for a very long time and have been consistent and don't seem to be actually hurting other people, well, probably they're not a show. <laughs> probably. Bob, uh, you're probably. the last one to answer the same question, which is, uh, what do you think uh, we should focus on? Would it be activism or would it, what do you, how should we get well, this message out? What I think we should focus on is exactly the direction I'm trying to take Globebusters into uh, and also FE Core. And we need to get out to the public, you know, some of our results and our experiments that we have found uh, the laser test, the gyroscope test, the ring laser gyroscope, uh, the microwave RF test. Um, we are striving to do them to the very best of our abilities and, um, you know, document them very meticulously. And then after that, we target the educational and professional industries with those results and ask them to either... But anyway, um, yeah, so I think, you know, once we get all these results collected, um, we try and get those out to the academic institutions and, you know, have them evaluate what we have done um, and then corroborate that. Um, and that's probably one of the most effective ways that we can actually get the word out um, and also issue a challenge, um, maybe even with some money involved, uh, to some of the uh, higher education institutions. I know that uh, there are currently several challenges out. Uh, not one is... Uh, uh, the $5,000 NASA Eclipse Challenge, uh, where some individuals are releasing all this uh, data about eclipses for the last 50 years, and the challenge is, is to corroborate it and fit it into the heliocentric model. Thus far, nobody has taken that challenge. So these are things that, that you know, are very telling to me because anybody can use an extra $5,000. But uh, So if we can get this information out there and issue challenges, uh, ask them to match what we have found. I think that's one of the best ways we can advance our cause. Yeah. Hmm? All right. Well, I'm wondering, once they've already said they've located, why is the bell yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this is the last question, and if you've got questions for any of the panelists, you'll have the opportunity to ask it after this question, so start formulating. Mark, what do you think the best piece of advice you could Wait. give to a brand new flat earther would be? All right. Um, <laughs> sorry. The, 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 uh, the best the, advice... For a, new flat a brand new flat earther coming yeah. in. Yeah, some might be here right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if yeah, if I was running into a, a flat earther that was yeah if, for the first time, if you're in like a week or a month, uh, first thing I would tell you is don't forget what it took for you to get there. Meaning uh, the the most common problem I ever run with with anyone in the flat Earth community 
is that they, once it takes them, so we plant the seed, it gets in their head, and then they flip and they become a flat earther. And then for whatever reason, they forget how long it took them. So if it took them two weeks or two months, they forget that, that entirely. And then all of a sudden, they, they get so full of enthusiasm and they, they rush to their family and say, oh, oh yeah, I convinced these people in two hours, I can convince these people in a cup of coffee. And they just get smacked in the face because, you know, they, they, it's like, they don't understand. It's like, why, why can't you get this? I got it. It's no, no, no. You forgot how long it took for you to get there. Just, it's not your job to convince people in two hours. It's just plant the seed and let it grow naturally like it did in you. There you go. That's a good answer. Jeremy. Yeah, I'd say that uh, I tell them to watch, if they're watching videos and they hear something that they think might be a fact, I mean, there's so much wrong information out there now. Mm. That, you know, even uh, I'm responsible for it. I mean, when we started doing this, you know, a lot of people got things wrong or made mistakes, and those things have been cleaned up, but you have to, you'd have to be doing your research to see that. I mean, if you uh, think that you know the answer to some question, or uh, if you're going to say that the horizon always rises to eye level, then you need to look into that and see that there's reasons why when you get up um, higher that you are seeing a little bit of a drop, but it's because Ladies the horizon the is uh, apparent. So, yes, I yeah, so, yeah, it's basically it. Just to make sure you, you know, double check your facts because there's, uh, like I was saying about the horizon, you know, the, it's an apparent horizon. So if you, you just have to be armed with the right kind of information so that uh, you're ready to answer questions or to not make more videos saying wrong things and, right. and just kind of further We've all uh, setting us back. We've all where we've heard something on a video and it sounded right and it didn't show flat earth to be true and then told that to people and then found out later, well, that word doesn't really mean that or that. Yeah, that one of the worst things I did was on Globusters, uh, somebody had said that quote by Tesla that said, the earth is not a planet, it's a um, realm. A realm. And I mean, I, I just went straight to Globusters and said it and then I remember saying it, and as I said it, saying, I didn't check that. I right. didn't check that. I got to check it after the check show. Everything. After the show, I spent hours just looking for that. <laughs> Please let me find that damn quote. But it wasn't there. So, I mean, right. um, ended up it was, I think that guy Daryl something from Facebook is the one who just kind of made it up. There's a so, lot of memes out there you'll find on uh, social media that are attributed to people, things that people, famous people have said that may bolster flat earth, but you've got to make sure you find yeah, out if those really make sure said it, because oftentimes they do. Right. It's too good to be true. Rob Skiba, your answer. Um, there's a, shall I say, ancient proverb that says that a prophet is hailed everywhere except his hometown. And that's true. All You can see that in many different cases. Your friends and family, you're probably not going to convince them yourself because they know you. So what I would say to a, a zealous new flat earther is say, look, find the best videos that you that were convincing to you and just say, hey, check this out. Let somebody else do the hard work. You, know, you can do the follow-up, but send them to a video that, that you, for somebody that you trust or whatever, a convincing set of videos, and let your friends and family watch those because they're really probably not going to listen to you. That's what I would say. All right. You're the last one to answer the question. Bob. Okay. Well, for me personally, uh, I would have to say, do not play by their rules. Meaning that when people try and debate you on flat earth, and, and a lot of, anyway, back to what I was saying, um, a lot of people want to originally, to go out and talk to people about it. And you will get ridiculous responses like, well, you know, if the earth was flat, it would be daylight all day long, right? Well, that kind of response only indicates that, you know, the person that you're talking to has no idea what the flat earth model is actually about. And so what they're assuming, obviously, is the sun is 93 million miles away. Well, if that was actually true, um, then you, yeah, you probably would have 24-hour daylight, stuff like that. So they will constantly try and drag you into their mathematics, their model, and say, well, how is this possible? Um, one example uh, that I can give is there's another pilot um, that uh, challenged me to, to navigate the flat earth <laughs> using the longitude and latitude system uh, for the globe. And, you know, I'm just, when he asked that, it, it hit me. It's like, oh my God, this is really what your problem is. You're trying to ask me to navigate using a flat earth or, or a global longitude and latitude system, uh, which obviously does not work the same way on a flat earth. And he couldn't get his head around that, obviously. And he still to this day issues that challenge to all flat earthers. But it's very clear that there would be a different type of setup uh, if, if we had one for the flat Earth, uh, possibly like a grid system or something like that. 
But the bottom line is, is, is you've got to not play by their rules. Remember that when they are speaking, they're always speaking in terms of their model. And you'll find that it very seldom ever applies to the flat earth. And if you're not on your toes, you'll get sucked right into that argument, and then you'll get your butt kicked. So. Great advice. And another bit of information I just thought of. Remember the movie It's a Wonderful Life? Everyone's seen that? Yeah. There's a point in there that every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. Wow. So there you go. A lot of wings. <laughs> Where's that guy? Nice. Yeah. So Didn't believe in angels. We've all been promoted. So now is the opportunity, if you've got a question for anybody here, including me, that you can ask. And the lights are blinding me, but I do believe we still have microphones set up on either side. Anybody? You guys can see. Who's got the mic? Hand. So, and it'd be so awesome if, I don't know, start? did they say their name and where they're from? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The <clears throat> if also, you could say who you are and where you're from, I'd like to know. Yes. And I don't know if they did that in the other panels. Yes. Um, I'll leave that microphone. Who's? Mm. You will. I will. So he doesn't have to share. So. <laughs> yeah, so Patricia, just. Question, yeah. You can just um, raise your hand. The mic. Yes, in fact, I do know we had one question up front here, though, that they wanted me to ask, so here you go. All right, wonderful. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the reporter there, where he was saying that we were always bringing the Bible into this. And I just wanted to say that the people that are pushing this agenda always bring Satan into it. And as Rob showed with Apollo and everything else, it's constantly showing, you know, their Luciferianism. And, and it goes much deeper than just a lie. It's uh, your salvation and where your soul is going to end up. And, you know... I just wanted to really thank everybody for coming here and telling the truth. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Raise your hand. I'll make my way back. Oh, no. Oh, here we go again. Cheers. Awesome. Sorry, this here was a question I know for Rob. Um, I was going to ask you earlier on, but whenever you guys are going to talk about going on the offensive, is it... So what, what research are you currently doing and who are you partnering up with that could really propel uh, this movement forward? You know, somebody who's really mainstream that sort of uh, would partner or co-author co some of your research material. Uh, oh, my well, uh, for me, part of the going on the offensive, um, some of you may be aware of this, but Dr. Robert Sengenis, who was behind the movie The Principal, so... <laughs> Uh, Dr. Robert Sengenis, the guy who did the principal, recently published a book, Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, 730-page book, uh, in which I'm mentioned about 180 times. <laughs> so I was like, wow, okay, I guess I should feel honored by that, but wow. Um, so, you know, at first when something like that happens, you know, you get hurt. I mean, it's like, geez, oh, this sucks. Then I was like, you know what? So I started, yeah, I, got, I got his book. So I start looking through the book. Now, obviously, you know, he claims to be a Christian and claims the Bible is the source for truth. So, you know, there are lots of science-type stuff in that book. And I figured, well, you know, I know my gifting. I know my, what I, the things that I am wired to deal with. So I looked at just the Bible size, about 80-something pages. And I'm like, I'm going to attack that because his eisegesis is unbelievable and pretty easy to refute, in my opinion. And we are scheduled at some point to do a debate. Um, but I went and immediately got the domain isflatearthflatwrong.com. And so my goal is to partner with people that want to help me to demolish this guy's arguments, all of them. Now, obviously, on the Christian biblical side of things, there are... So, uh, so I, his book is Flat Earth, Flat Wrong. I got the domain is Flat Earth, Flat Wrong. And I want to partner with people on all aspects of it, from the scientific side of things to the biblical side of things. And the people that I trust that I can give a... I have a WordPress site. Um, to give them um, author accounts on my site where they can just rip apart his book, take whatever section that you want and, you know... It's open to all you guys as well uh, to help me out with this, but uh, to partner with other people because, you know, he's making the rounds right now. He's, he's one of the big detractors out there. Um, but I'll say this at the same time as saying, you know, he's about 80% on our side, <laughs> you know, when you really get down to it. So I would actually like to see him converted, uh, you know, ultimately. But part of my strategy right now as far as me going on the offense, offense is, is going I want to have so many articles on my website that if anybody looks up Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, all the Google <laughs> searches are going to be from my site, <laughs> not his. 
Uh, and then what we may be able to do then, if everybody's open to it, if, I, if the idea is that it be an open source uh, place for people to deposit their information, that anybody who's so inclined can take any of that content on there and make a compilation book of their own hmm. uh, to go up against him. So, you know, theoretically, we could have a lot of different books because let's say everybody on the panel here contributes to it and I have my own take on it. Well, I can, if we're all open to that and it's open source, I can say, well, Jaron's got a great, great quote right here. You know, when Jaron says da da da, and I could put together my own book that would have his information. He could do the same thing. Everybody could do the same thing. So we need to start getting stuff out there, you know, more than just our YouTube, I think. And we need to be more um, mindful of the need to unite uh, and to go on the offensive. No, that's my opinion. And do people know that Son Genis is the one from the, the movie The Principal? I, well, I think a lot of people do. I don't know. Yeah. You know, he, Which he, is a great movie if you haven't seen it. It yeah. absolutely destroys the globe. He, d he destroys heliocentricity from a scientific point of view as well as from a biblical world. Sorry, so, you know, yeah, from both. So, like I said, he's about 80% on our side. <laughs> so, you know, but uh, I'm not backing down from these people and, and the creation scientists especially. I mean, what they're doing to the text is just, they're just torturing it. So. And we would work with mainstream Nobody here would be opposed to that. The mainstream scientists are the ones opposed to even considering the idea. Perhaps someday it will happen, but perhaps someday the bell will stop ringing. Too. Maybe not. <laughs> Patricia, we got a question right here. Hi, right. Connie from Red Deer. Um, if the moon is closer, if the moon is closer than what we've been told, and yes. smaller, and goes in a predictable. Um, path right. and w is within the dome. Sure. Why could we not visit it? Is that a question for me? Or anybody? Oh, anybody. I'll, I'll answer just in the fact that I think that the, the idea of people landing on a ball is not possible. By teaching everybody that it happened, it kind of subconsciously makes us think that we could live on a ball. So. I mean, personally, I think that no matter what the moon is, I don't think it's a big rock in the sky because it kind of breaks, um, you know, a lot of the laws of physics that I would uh, think exist. But then again, it is a celestial item. It's not a terrestrial item. So, I mean, for me, I just, um, I don't think it's someplace you can go because I don't think you can stand on a, you know, a spherical rock unless you were on the very top of it. <laughs> They're telling us right now their problem, even today, is getting through the radiation. You know, the Orion program was the new program that followed the uh, retiring of the space shuttle program. And there's a you know, famous video many of you guys have probably already seen now that NASA put out saying, you know, talking about the Orion project and saying one of our biggest problems right now is figuring out how to get through the radiation. And of course, anybody with half a brain should be raising their hand and going, uh, why don't you just put on the same jumpsuits and get in the same tin can you did 50 years ago? <laughs> you know, and go clean up Fukushima while you're at it. Mm -hmm. That stuff actually works. Um, and I, you know, I think Mark's got a great idea in his challenge to, maybe you can talk about the challenge about the vacuum chamber. And the <laughs> oh yeah, I'm probably going to die in a vacuum chamber, so, <laughs> so you guys know. But the other uh, thing is, we don't actually get closer to the moon. If you notice, when you go up towards it, you don't, it gets further away. Yeah. So it, it isn't like we see it full moon and we start flying in an airplane and we get closer to it. Uh, so it doesn't seem like, it's almost like, a, what do you call that, a lenticular, um, I don't know if you've ever seen those things. You walk by and you can kind of see them change. Yeah, yeah. Is that lenticular? Is that the uh, name? I can't remember the name. Yeah, it kind of seems like the moon is, is like that, or the atmosphere is like that, that it's, uh, it's portraying for each person. Um, rainbow. Yeah, like a rainbow. So that's what it seems like. Real, real quick, uh, the, the challenge I came up with was, was born out of people that were interviewing me saying, is there anything we can show you that would get you to believe in a ball, a globe, a sphere anymore? And I used to say, that, you know, put a 4K camera on top of a rocket, you know, and let it run. Don't turn it off. Don't edit anything. But I thought, that's, that's going to take forever. No one's ever going to do it. And so I tried to boil it down even simpler. I said, let's do something on the ground. Uh, because there, up until now, I don't think there were any tests on the ground. And what we can do is we can create a vacuum chamber, you know, in, in all sorts of different universities. And we should have plenty of spacesuits for the last 50 years because they all work perfectly. None of them ever had a problem. And so I said, okay, give me a NASA suit, put me in it, put me in the chamber, and then pull the lever and, and see what happens. Tell me how I don't die. <laughs> and, no, no, it sounds good in theory. I think you should put them in there. Yeah, well, yeah, okay, yeah, it's you also. Videotape it. Yeah, yeah. The other part was I want to go in with somebody else. It's not just me. I'd rather have somebody from science. 
standing next holding to me, hands with you, yeah. yeah, holding hands while while this we both go down. <laughs> but but it's true. I, that was my, my the thing I came up with because a fabric suit, a fabric bag of air cannot survive in a vacuum. And I challenge any of you here to even come up with a sci a sci-fi explanation. That's how I knew it was going to work because I couldn't even come up with anything in movies and television. I could not imagine the technology that's supposedly in that backpack that stops a suit from going tight as a snare drum and bursting. And why so. that technology isn't used for so many other things oh, yeah. for all of us here on yeah. Earth. Even the way they say the suits can protect from micrometeors when yeah. on the ISS, they're out doing spacewalks. Yeah. Let's have that stuff on our cars on the exterior, on our children's bicycle helmets. Right. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Great. But you were also talking, speaking of the bell, but having like different things in there, like a balloon, Wait. so we see the balloon expand. Yeah. You were talking about putting a balloon in there so it expands in water so it boils. And, yeah, well, oh yeah, the three the tests. Bell. Yeah, the bell, because the bell to, won't to make any sound. To verify that they are, in fact, in a vacuum chamber. Right. You do that test, those three tests first, then. Well, have wait. them in there with those things. Yeah, 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 because it can't be faked. Well, you can't, have, can't fake all three. And, and you could, those three things would cost you all, what, four dollars? It's easy to do. Alright, I'm Whitney, I'm from Wade. school. Wade, I, I will hand it to Canada, they are thorough. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely thorough. My name is Whitney, I'm from here as well. Uh, this is for Jaron. Um, I've gotten to talk to us about everyone there so far, except for you, Jaron. Uh, my question for you is more along the line of your freedom of information request to NASA mm -hmm. and the development on that. I haven't heard anything on that lately. You may have put it up on your YouTube channel or something, but I haven't seen it yet. No, I haven't. Finally, they, it took a month till I got the money back from my bank, and then I was able to submit the payment again, and it went through this time. <clears throat> then she told me uh, July, uh, July 17th, she said she would have it by the 30th. I never got any calls. And then just the uh, day before yesterday, she called and told me to make the final payment that they have the video. So uh, as soon as I make that payment, then they should ship it. So we'll see what... Uh, we get because I had to send them a hard drive, so uh, there's something on there according to her. Do you let everyone know what? Absolutely. Oh yeah, it's going to be all released uh, to archive.org and then also on my channel in its completion, whatever I get. Uh, my name is James from uh, Calgary, Alberta. Uh, just a question for everybody: uh, When you first started discussing flat Earth, uh, have you ever had any close friends or family, maybe extended family, that have reacted badly uh, to this? Um, maybe got uh, aggressive, overly hostile, um, or just cut ties with you, and how have you dealt with it? Uh, I, I started out by saying, if you want to see somebody get in touch with their inner psycho, <laughs> just mention that you're looking into it. And you will see sweet old ladies go bat crap crazy right in front of you. Your grandmother that was like the sweetest woman ever, like, go insane. And I've seen, wow, people that I never in a million years would have imagined losing it go crazy in front of me. And, you know, that's what made me think there is something on a spiritual level here. Like, it's, it's, it, I can't explain it. Uh, in any rational sense, why somebody would go with that berserk in front of me mm. just at the mere mention of, hey, you know, I'm looking into this flat earth thing. Yeah, I've, I've lost friends. You know, for the most part, my family has been really cool with it because uh, they've been along with me on the journey. And like I <laughs> said during one of my presentations when I sh I'm showing my dad stuff, who was also a pilot. So, you know, I got him going with the attitude indicator. I'm like, Dad, you know, it's been about 20 years since I've flown. I think I remember how the, you know, can you explain how the attitude indicator works again? And he went through the whole thing. So I popped out on him and he's like, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, my immediate family has been pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, I've lost good friends and, and other people have just taken off. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't yeah, had any, anything so much like that um, that I can think of. Nobody got real upset. Although I do think a reason why people would is, you know, everything changes in your life. Uh, you know, your parents uh, you know, pass away, your grandparents passed away, you change schools, you change homes, and the one thing that never changes is the ball earth. So it's kind of like that baby blanket for people that, you know, it's just the one thing that they thought they'd never have to even question because it's been a ball since you were born. So I think that could be a reason why people lose it because that's kind of all they have to hold on to, you know. Um, I, most of my family was okay with it or neutral with it because I'm a 
pretty strange guy sometimes anyway. <laughs> Still, somewhat eccentric. But I did have a cousin who I'd only talked to maybe twice a year write me an email and just lace me with profanity. <laughs> you know, it's like, what the bleep, 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 bleep. It's like, and, and I hadn't written her in, in probably, I don't know, a year at least. And, and that was her opening line. And I <laughs> save it now as sort of a little inspiration. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, I'm also saving it for if we run into it. We haven't spoken since, and I have to go through her twin sister. To, to, but yeah, I mean, it does happen from time to time. I told my sister and my brother, my sister said, yeah. very I don't have time to look into it. We've all heard that. My brother said, have you become, quote, a crazy Christian, unquote, and are you a Holocaust denier who hates Jews? <laughs> I went, what about anything I said? No, right. You know, <laughs> and you've known me all my life, and you, and it was a weird response. But that's a taught the response. I mean, that is a response. trained response. Yeah. Yeah. Patricia, we have another question here. Yes. Uh, Lynn from Idaho. Uh, you know, I, I'm a flat earther, but if you look at the night sky, there's a ton of heliocentric model evidence. I mean, you got this, the moon that looks 3D, like a sphere with the craters. You got, you know, phases of the moon shining to the sun like it's reflecting off it. You got planets that look like they're orbiting with us around the sun. You have Jupiter moons. You got comets with solar wind tails. So either... Whoever created the flat earth decided to put all this in place to mess with our heads, or hologram technology came along at some point, although look at all the flaws to it, so they had the technology to do it, but they didn't do it perfect, or what? Help me out here. So. Who wants to Who wants that it? one? Want me to jump I think some of the things you said may be true, and some might be. I think See. Oh, I was going to say, you know, you call it he heliocentric, uh, you know, evidence, but at the same time, why? You know, who, the saying I like to throw out to people is, uh, yeah, God created the sun and the moon, but it was NASA that told you what they were and how far they were away. And what, yeah, and what's happening in the sky. So, you know, I, I, I generally jump back to, you know, what we can do now. You know, like 2001, A Space Odyssey, I challenge anyone to go in with a Blu-ray and, and look at that moon when they're heading towards the moon. It's gorgeous. It's flawless. And we did that movie back in the 60s. We're talking about powers and technology. It's way, way beyond us. And if it was all heliocentric proof, I think that uh, then they would have said it was heliocentric from the start. But they obviously didn't because no one had taught it to them when they were, you know, in kindergarten. Right. So I think we are all very conditioned to uh, look at things on that kind of spherical model, and then everything makes sense in the planets. And um, but I myself struggle with. I watch Jupiter and its moons, you know, almost every night, and it is interesting. But then again, I've never been shown, you know, enough evidence to say that Jupiter is bigger than a basketball or bigger than a, um, you know, 10 foot or 100 foot. I don't know how big it is. They tell me it's 100 times as big as the Earth, and I think that that's ridiculous. And I don't think there's evidence for it. So. Until they prove those things to me, I, I just look at it as a light in the sky, and it's got um, you know, four little lights that seem to circle it or follow it. And what happens up there doesn't really make what we're standing on like what's up there. True. It's way different. I mean, look at all the life that's here, and we know that there's even NASA, but there's no life anywhere else. So it's a very big difference between this place where, well, I feel the Earth is the biggest thing that there is by far. You know, it's, there's nothing even close to the size of the Earth. Um, Except Elon Musk's ego. There you go. Or, or, yeah. <laughs> and also, you have to remember that the heliocentric cosmology is the new kid in town. Uh, before that, every culture on Earth, going back as far as recorded history, um, has had the cosmology as a flat, stationary Earth. Um, all of the, you know, we talked about uh, some of the instruments that were found, like the Antikythera device and, and astrolabes and stuff like this, that absolutely show that this, these predictions and, and this cosmology was just as viable on a flat Earth as it is on the heliocentric model. It's only been the last 500 years, basically, that they've been back engineering it and also making up a lot of their own facts as they go along, uh, you know, like, like putting the, the sun out to 93 million miles. But before it was that, uh, it was much further, and it's also been much closer. So it's been a trial and error process for the heliocentrists also. 
Hi, my name is Jessica Mason. I'm from Grand Prairie, Alberta, five hours west from here. Um, my question is, for a lot of us are on social media, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and as you know, they are censoring big time. So posts are getting taken down, people's YouTube's pages are disappearing. I mean, I'm a nobody and my posts are deleted all the time. So do you guys have any alternative media sources that we can go to when this all shuts down? Mm. Very good question. Yeah. I <clears throat> I think that's probably very much on all of our minds. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you, you put a lot of time and effort into the content and trying to build your subscription base and everything else, and like at any second, it could all go away. Uh, I, don't, I have yet to find the alternative yet. I am still looking myself because each one that I've been told about has its problems also. Uh, so I don't have that solution, but what I've been doing with my subscribers is saying, look, I'm creating an email list. Get on my email list because if one day you go and find my YouTube channel's gone, that's about the only way I'm going to be able to contact most of you. <laughs> you know, so th that's what I'm taking steps to do right now, but I don't know, maybe you guys know of some alternatives, but I think that's on all of our minds right now. now it also seems like YouTube's got the handle on... Uh video players that actually play well in a browser. And it's just, I don't know about everybody else, I can't get videos to play anywhere else. It seems like, so if you want a decent running video with, uh, that works well, it's like YouTube's the only place. Um, but if and anybody has any sites the only game in town, and they're also playing with it, as Mark's pointed out before, yeah. with yeah. the search. I'd also like to say that it don't don't think, and I know the Alex Jones thing that happened just as we were coming up here, you know, probably weighing on all your minds. But don't forget that that was an individual. And Flat Earth is an idea. I mean, technically, we could all die in a plane crash tomorrow. No, not going to happen. But, but at the same time, uh, you know, Flat Earth keeps going. I mean, Flat Earth is a massive, massive idea. You try to shut down Flat Earth at this point, it would be very, very difficult to do. Uh, I have to quote real quick the, um, the Google uh, YouTube engineer that finally, after he left Google for a certain amount of time, his disclosure agreement uh, lapsed and he get, did an interview. And, what, and literally out of all the things he could have picked in terms of topics, he was asking how search engines work and how things are recommended. And he goes, look, when somebody watches 20 flat earth, flat earth videos in a row, what do you think we're going to recommend? We're going to recommend that. Uh, we are still this secret cash cow for YouTube because sure. a lot of people, a lot of people go into it. And I'll, I'll finish with this. When the adpocalypse, if you guys didn't know what that was, when YouTube wanted to get, get some of their bigger sponsors back and they were going after some of the channels that were out there and shutting them down, Flat Earth did not take much of a hit uh, in comparison. Yeah, there were a few channels that, that took hits here and there. But, you know, I, I can't speak for any of you guys here, but I lost no videos. From, from YouTube, and most of the people I talked to didn't lose any videos. Flat Earth is bigger than just a, a small bias that's out there. When people come against us, it's, it's not that easy to pin down. I can't even imagine if I was even working for YouTube how I would take out Flat Earth. There's too many ways to sneak it in, but anyway. Keep using the social media that you've got yeah. until otherwise uh, informed, and use it a lot. If, if, no matter what you do, just try to talk about it. I, I think, you know, we the whole fight club thing, you know, don't talk about it. I really think we should try to talk about it as much as possible. But of course, know who you're talking to and yeah. approach them a way that would make sense to them. And yeah, then don't, if you're shut down, don't waste a lot of time with them. Don't engage in fighting with them. You can never convert anyone by fighting. Yeah. Don't, yeah, do, wrote one more real quick thing. Don't pick a fight if you don't have to. That's, that's the Fight Club reference, which is, look, if you know they're going to come at you, if you if, yeah, fine, if you're in, in a mood for a fight, sure, go ahead. But don't, don't sacrifice friends and family and coworkers just because you, you want to ham-fist it. You know, show some delicacy when you're doing it. Sometimes being right is something that you know. You yeah. don't have to. Patricia, we have another question? Yes, and then uh, there's a gentleman here. And Eddie, you wanted to ask the question too, right, eventually? All right. Great. This is kind of a mix. Uh, it's Rob from Windsor here. Thanks, guys, for answering all the questions that you have. Uh, so, Shambhala, right? We have the North Pole. We have Santa Claus lives there, maybe. And the testimony of Admiral Byrd going there. What's your kind of thoughts on that? And then going into the lights, or sorry, the, the stars and the sun, being as for times and seasons of what's to come and what is happening now, your thoughts on astrology uh, with the occult and New Age and just all that kind of wrapped up. Yeah, not to... Not to no, no, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's a 
Anyone? I, I, would, I, would, I would love to go north. I mean, I, I think that if anybody can ever orchestrate some sort of a, you know journey up there, that would be the best thing that we could do. I don't think you'd make it. I mean, I'm not saying that they would kill you. I just don't know if logistically it could happen. But it, yeah, I think it's a huge importance to, to see. Were you talking to um, Bob earlier about the idea of the magnetic mountain? Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, I think that's highly possible, you know, that uh, there is some sort of Mount Maru um, there at the center that you know, that's why they don't have flights that go right over it. They seem to go uh, askew. And they don't let anybody within a certain range there. So uh, I think we've got to get there. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, uh, you know, for a while, all of our attention was on Antarctica, what's going on. And I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on down there for sure. Uh, but the temperature difference between the south and the north is dramatic. I mean, it's just crazy how different it is. And the north is way more reasonably accessible. I'm sure that there are probably some sort of government restrictions and things. But in, in terms of climate and other things, it's a lot more accessible. And when you start, when, well, at least when I started to look into the whole Rupus Negra, Mount Meru, sides of the north, Mount Zion, whatever you want to call it, this thing that's supposedly in the center of the north, um, it gets very interesting. In fact, most of us went to schools that had the Mercator map hanging in our classroom. And if you look into Mercator and read what he wrote to John Dee, Mercator wrote this letter to John Dee describing in quite a bit of detail about this magnetic lodestone mountain uh, with a circumference of a 33 miles, I think it was, or is a diameter, I forget, of 33 miles. Uh, that has four rivers going out from it with four island-like small continents around it. And, uh, you know, many ancient cultures had an understanding of this place and regularly wrote about it. And when you see that that writing in, uh, about this place, it goes all the way into the 1940s with uh, Admiral Byrd, I think there's something to it. You know, and I, I'm now, I don't believe in Santa Claus, but I, I am now... What? Uh, no, I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am, like, Getting way close. more interested in the north than I am in the south. Yeah. And, Could, I, and I think if we can, if there's any way to get there, I would, you know, look, if we can at least get to the, to the landmass, that's cool enough because the rivers are pretty wild and the description of the four uh, land I uh, islands there are pretty amazing. And I would like to get as far on the land to go see the Whirlpool because there's something like 400 or 500 miles across Whirlpool at the center. It, it, that the, the mountain is in the center of this Whirlpool. Wow. I mean, yeah. that's pretty crazy. Yeah. What about the stars and the signs and seasons? And I would actually just like to get into Aurora Borealis really quick with that, with the Whirlpool. With Aurora being a light and Bor being a hole, like Borealis, um, Light coming from a hole, what's up with that? Um, okay, uh, how many of you guys have seen the video that I did with Andy Hoy and his tabernacle model? Anybody raise your hand? Anybody see that? Uh, if you haven't, you should look through my video list for the video that I did with a guy named Andy Hoy. And now, mind you, the information came at, to me at a time when I was really beat down, like, you know. When I first got into this with Mark in April 2015, I started blogging like crazy and writing and putting up what eventually became testingglobe.com. By August, you know, everybody in the world's coming after me, attacking me. I got sciatica. My wife's father, my father-in-law is in our living room dying of cancer. It was a rough season. And I said, screw this, I'm done. I put up Phil Collins, I don't care anymore, on every page of my website. I put up, <laughs> I put up the Phil Collins video, I don't care anymore. I was like, forget it, I I'm, I'm done with this. Uh, then I get this letter from an atheist saying, how dare you, you know, and it was actually an atheist that made me put it back up again because of how much it meant to him. Um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. What was the original question? <laughs> Aurora Borealis. Oh, Aurora Borealis. So this, I'm in the middle of all this, like, I'm, in, I'm way down low. And I get this package in the mail by the, from this guy, Andy Hoy. And usually it's something like that. It goes in the, I'll get to it later pile, which I almost never get to. I finally opened it up and looked at it, and he had these very detailed, he's an engineer, and he's a Hebrew scholar, and he had spent time in Israel studying the tabernacle in the wilderness. And as an engineer, he's saying the usual rectangular box that is usually depicted as the ancient tabernacle doesn't work from an engineering perspective, nor does it work from a linguistic when you look at the text and everything. So he went back to the text and looked at it in Hebrew, and as an engineer, he said, wait a minute, everybody's assuming you connect the long curtains 
on the long ends. The, the, the text just says connect them at the, at the ends. Everybody assumes the long ends, and when you do, you get a re rectangular box. But he says the text doesn't demand that, so I wonder what, what would happen if I connected it at the short ends. And when he did, he ended up with a six-story high circular dome tent, within which is the Holy of Holies that has uh, curtains set up with cherubim on them. Uh, and if that is a blueprint of something that Moses was shown in heaven, I believe he may have been shown what I call the Yahuwah terrarium, or this place that we're living in. In which case, the throne would be right above it, and the curtains in the tabernacle represent what we call the Aurora Borealis. Isn't, isn't that exactly what that cosmos endo, endopolidiosis uh, from... Christian topography. Oh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the Egyptian monk yeah. cosmos. Yeah, he's something he along those, thing, right? yeah, along those lines. So, you know, I don't know, but it, you know, it seems rather interesting that we may have this thing called Rupus Negra, Mount Meru, the sides of the North Mount Zion, right under the location of the throne, and we have this curtain. And if you've ever seen the Northern Lights, and we're hoping to <laughs> in the next couple of days, maybe, uh, it's, it looks like these wavy curtains up there in the sky. So that is a fantastic answer. Wizard of Oz, with the cart behind the curtain lies the truth. The man with all the power. There's a lot of these things hmm. that are connected. But yeah, look up that video. I did a whole thing on it with Andy Hoy. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you first for coming to Edmonton. Everyone who came, thank you. Welcome. Please come back next year. It's super fun. Yeah. I'm from Edmonton. My name's Grace. Um, I just more than a question. I sort of have a comment. I'd like to go back to what you were talking about earlier about how to talk to someone who has never thought about flat Earth before. And um, I'm nervous. I'm going to lean on you. <laughs> Don't be nervous. <laughs> um, I think that Mark was right when he suggested going after first NASA and the American space program, because I think that's what happened to me. And regardless of your politics, if everyone could just kind of take a deep breath and go, huh, and forget who you like and don't like and what the media especially has told us, because as you pointed out and as most of us know, we are being lied to. And I think that's something we can really all agree on. Like, that's a really good jump off point almost is to, to point that out, that, yeah, we're definitely being lied to about some things, right? Mm. So. Um, with, with NASA, for example, I saw with my own eyes and heard, watched a video where NASA, in a compilation with Obama actually, um, admitting that we cannot leave Earth's lower orbit. Yeah. So if we can't leave Earth's lower orbit, and the moon isn't in Earth's lower orbit apparently, how did we go? And if it is within Earth's lower orbit, then we're being lied to about where it is exactly, right? And the size of it, too. And that's where I think the moon is really interesting. And there's other reasons, too, of course. When it comes to, uh, let's say, Trump, for example, he stood with um, Buzz Aldrin beside him, and he said, and Buzz made all kinds of weird faces. I don't know if you've seen that video. <laughs> anyway, regardless of what you think of Buzz Aldrin, even, um, Trump said that it's um, going to be difficult for people to understand why we're creating a space program when there is no space. And you can Google it, Trump says there is no space, what, what, regardless of what you think of him. And so he also said, oh, I forgot at the top of my head, I'm sorry. But it's interesting, if you pay attention, I think, just to what we're being told on that level, it shows that we're right. We are right about being lied to. It's a good place to start, I think, right? And if there is a reason why we haven't lived or left Earth's lower orbit, what is it? And if it is a dome and you're talking to scientists, suggest something like plasma. Get them thinking, like, what could it be? It doesn't have to be, and that was the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is that I don't think you have to be religious to believe that we're being lied to or that there's a chance that we, there is a dome or something above us, something. Call it a firmament, call it a dome, call it plasma, call it whatever you want. But there's something. There's some reason why we can't leave Earth's lower orbit. What is it? Right? So, I don't know. Just a thought. Just a way to maybe get the ball rolling. That's all. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You have a beautiful okay. voice, by the way.
And, uh, Patricia, you are so gorgeous, no one would believe your age ever, ever, ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do want to respond to, to one comment that you made, um, you know, about why is it that we can't get out there. And a, a very interesting news item came up, I don't know, about two or three years ago uh, from the University of Colorado uh, and then was also verified by MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And in this article, they describe that they have found a Star Trek-like shield um, about 7,000 miles above the Earth. And they say that it, it is so bizarre that it, it seems like it's an absolute solid object. And they have no explanation for it, but they're saying, well, this has got to be what's, what's protecting us from the Van Allen radiation belts. Uh, but yeah, just the fact that that came out by, by CSU and then was verified by MIT, that in and of itself should really make people uh, question things. Sure. So. Hi, my name is Ellie from St. Albert. And I'm just wondering, with all the different space stations that we've had up there, the American, the Russian, the international, do you guys know of any experiments that have benefited mankind? <laughs> That's a great question. A lot of money, and uh, no. And you, you'd think that these actors that they hire, or astronauts, whatever you want to call them, you'd think that they would have something to say when they're asked, what experiments are you doing? And every time they just say the word science, over and over again, and it can, can't even make up one. So it's pretty pretty pathetic. But I think that's you know based off what she said too. You know that's where we need to start with people, point those things out. NASA says that uh, every astronaut is one of 4,000 applicants. I mean, you should we should be expecting so much higher of a caliber than we're getting. Yeah. It seems like they play with toys on uh, the ISS, really. The gorilla suit. Water car, water ping pong every ping -pong, time. And, um, showing us how toilets work and how you wash your hair. Things that would amuse yeah. children, stuffed animals flying in the air, and continually growing lettuce for some strange reason. Yeah, John and I always make that joke that you can look it up, just Google it and then change the time that you're searching. Go back to 1990 to 95 or 95 to 2000, and they're always, uh, they grew lettuce on the ISS for the first time. Same and same it's the same thing over and over again, so. A few different times. Yeah. yeah. And they yeah. present it every time as if, um, I mean, it might start to get you to believe in the Mandela effect, as if it's brand new information. Right. And I think that's how they're, like the book 1984, when they change the truth yep. and then throw the old story down the memory hole where it would burn and disappear. That's how they're tricking everybody who's not paying close attention. Just, uh, just saying a totally different story and everyone just believes it's true. And that's why it's really important for us, all at Flat Earth, it's not just who's here, to remain vigilant and keep track of these, these right. lies. Yeah, take screenshots and things like that. Because yeah. you're absolutely right. That's what scares me about the Mandela effect. I don't think that the Mandela effect it, itself is true. I think it's just bad memories. But then what they're going to do with that is once everybody's convinced it's just our bad memories, then they start removing things from history, and the answer is going to be, oh, we remembered it wrong. Right. So that's the plan, is uh, by making us think, oh, sex in the city, sex and the city, how do we spell Fruit Loops, people are going to get used to the fact, oh, it's just our bad memories, and then when they start plucking things off the Internet, uh, it's going to be our default answer is, oh, I guess yeah. I just remember that yeah, wrong, so be careful. They already went to Mars in 15 years. They could just put that in the news. They're, They're not on Mars? Mars. Oh, okay. They're little robot cars. <laughs> yeah. It's already working on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. There is no dark side of the moon, really. As a matter of fact, it's all dark. There is Speaking no the dark mic. side of the moon, really. As a matter of fact, it's all dark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got it. Okay, yeah. my, my question happens to deal with, I haven't done it, I got lazy, I forgot, I don't know what the reason is, I've always wanted to get back into it, but I'm seeing, and I believe, and I accept, I don't know what to think, because again, I haven't done my homework. What's the deal, what they're telling us, the moon didn't start glowing until 1977? <laughs> I've never heard that. Nobody? Well, I, I know where you're going with this, but no, the, the moon, this was kind of, this was talked by a few other people, and that is, you know, wh when did we all of a sudden notice that the moon was glowing, you know, beforehand, like the entire Apollo space program, I think I know where you're going with this, uh, which is the entire, uh, when you go up and look at the moon in a full bright moon, you know, tonight or whenever it's full, it's really, really bright, uh, extremely bright, white, white. In fact, you can't even look at it with night vision. And yet, when you look at all the photos and movies of Apollo, it's this dark, dark, ashen gray. 
And we'll take it one step further in that, that picture that Rob shows where the, the moon is transiting in front of the Earth. The, the color's all wrong. The, it's, it's completely off. Uh, well, when it, the astronauts are on the moon, supposedly, why isn't this just this crazy bright white light shining on? Oh, yeah, it yeah. should be totally overexposed. That's interesting, too, because uh, what you see in the... I've looked into Galileo's drawings. Uh, they say before they had a telescope that they couldn't see the markings on the moon. There's no drawings of it from... 1400, 1200. So where, why wouldn't you be able to see what we can clearly see with our eyes? The light <laughs> <laughs> so well, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's no drawings of it. I mean, they didn't really. And in fact, they thought it was like uh, they didn't even think there was any kind of craters or anything on it until they got the telescope. So that story's never jive with me again. You know my opinion of history, so I don't really put much to it. But yeah. Interesting. Uh, another question? Yes. I find it really fascinating. Uh, uh, I've heard so many times <clears throat> Barack Obama scoff people who believe in flat earth. Mm -hmm. And also Hillary Clinton saying so many times, we've hit the glass ceiling. Yeah. I find it fascinating for people who don't believe it. Why would they use those kinds of terms? Another thing I want to bring up is my relatives prefer to be entertained than educated. That scares the hell out of me. So, yeah, it's... yeah, I think we all have relatives like that. Yeah. Yeah, let me throw in a quick story because I know we've got seven minutes left. Uh, to that to that point, I went to a, a party and they wanted to watch a movie, and they sat down and the, it's like they had a choice between uh, JFK, the movie from Oliver Stone, and Serenity, and I asked them which one they wanted, and almost everybody who had, had already seen Serenity, which was a space movie, an entertainment movie, and JFK, almost no one had seen. And I said, and I could recommend it. I was going, look, JFK is a brilliant, you know, brilliant film. Why you you got to watch this, at, you know, at least once. And the the reply back was almost unanimously was, we don't want to learn anything. We want to be entertained. Mm -hmm. And it was like, ah, killing me. Before we said, why are you always looking into things? Sometimes I just don't want to learn. Yeah. First and last day there. <laughs> I get another question. Very different kind of people. Yeah, right, here. My name's Brian from Red Deer, Alberta. So my question is, is there any credence to this pole shift that you keep hearing about? I guess if the Earth's flat, there wouldn't be, but there is obviously magnetic fields up north. We just automatically hand the microphone to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Bob. Okay, well, my answer to that is, is there could be a pole shift magnetically. And in fact, we are witnessing this happening at this very moment. Uh, Earth's magnetic fields are radically changing, and in fact, to, to the degree that a lot of airports are actually having to change, re, rename their uh, runway numbers uh, because the magnetic bearing is changing. And I find this interesting because um, we're also seeing some really radical changes, you know, weather-wise around the world. And um, one thing that, that I really find interesting is the whole story of uh, the rapture and also how this time around, you know, when the world ends, that it's going to basically be happening in fire. Well, if you follow the electric universe model and understand how this plasma actually works, if, if magnetically we do actually change this polarity, um, it could very well cause that thing that I was talking about today, about, you know, what is it that determines up from down to actually change over. Um, not, and, and that could be the catalyst that could cause things to actually start going up, and it would also wreak havoc with the plasma system. So I, I would say that it is possible. We are definitely seeing some very interesting signs regarding that, uh, not to mention all the, the heat waves. Of course, a lot of that could also be brought about by other uh, artificial manipulation of the weather. But uh, it, it certainly right now has enough evidence that uh, I would be watching it very carefully. Just in the interest of time, one more here. Hi, my name is Christina. I'm from Edmonton in area. Uh, I just was wondering what your guys' theories are with eclipses. And like from the Bible standpoint, like in Egypt during the plagues there was darkness. So was that an eclipse and what are, what is an eclipse? Yeah, um, you know in the Genesis account it says he makes two great lights. One to rule the day, one to rule the night. It doesn't say he makes a great light and a rock with this reflector. Uh, we see in other places where it says that the moon will not give her light. So, you know, from my perspective, from a biblical perspective, that these are they're some sort of light-generating objects that are up there. 
And if they can be turned on, I suppose they could be turned off. Now, eclipses are different. It's a scenario where something's going in front of something else. Um, now, I had a, I don't know what else to call it. It was like, a, it was more realistic than a dream. I don't know if it was an open vision or what it was. I don't know. But it was very uh, vivid. I was in this dream vision, whatever you want to call it. I was on a lake doing a long distance test with, with the P900. <laughs> And uh, there was this really loud boom, like this crazy loud, deep boom, and the sun shut off. <laughs> like, it's just like, boom, the sun just turned off. And it was beyond pitch black in my vision. And so in that, you know, what does it mean? I have no idea. Maybe, you know, I ate something before I went to bed. I don't know. But it was a tangible darkness, and that's the same type of darkness that's described during the time of the Exodus. So, you know, what does that mean? I don't know. You know, if they are just light bulbs that were turned on at the day four of creation, then they could be turned off, too. Other question? Actually, I have a thousand questions, but I'll <laughs> keep this short and simple. <laughs> um, my name is Bonnie. I'm from Sherwood Park. And I just wanted to let the people in the Edmonton area know that um, I really want to start having meetups here. So, yeah. Mark... Yeah. Thank you. So Mark has graciously um, offered to put the notices on his channel yep. so that everyone will know um, when and where the meetups are scheduled. And we hope to have a great turnout. And we hope to do this at least once a month. Cool. So hope to see you all soon again. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Excellent. May I have time for one more here? My name is Veronica. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, kind of following up with the last question, I just wanted to know if you guys believe in the sun simulators. The sun simulators? Yeah. Simulator. Yeah, I've seen video of uh, one of them that they have, the hexagon-looking one, um, which is pretty crazy because we know that they can put up things at 8,000 pounds on balloons. Uh, so, you know, that's why I've had a couple people try and offer to either buy my way down to Antarctica. They and they're Globers. They really want me to go to Antarctica and watch this 24-hour sun. And for me, it's just not worth the money because I don't think it would be proof because they put you in one spot with a bunch of people at a camp, and if I see a light just go around my head, I still am standing on a frozen tundra that's getting six months of sun, and I'm not sure that that's enough when I've seen that sun simulator. NASA's got two patents, I think, for it. Yeah, I was just going to mention that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's... Uh, it's definitely, they're not getting patents for fake things, I don't think. You know, I definitely think they have it. What for? I have no idea. Uh, they've got all kinds of telescope stuff down there in Antarctica, too, that's crazy that we don't get to see very much of huge things. You know, right. Ten-story high reflector mirrors and who knows what they're doing with that stuff. Does anyone else on the panel believe in them? I don't know enough about it. Yeah, I've seen some of the same stuff that he's I referring think they to. Exist by what I've seen. Yeah, I believe definitely. I've seen the patents that you can. I mean, right. you can just look but them of up. Of course, we all know that patents can be fake. Well, be yeah. fair enough. Right. But certainly, someone somewhere has been thinking about this and right. took the time to draw up schematics and go but through. Why? Yeah. What are they planning on using it for? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. And yeah. especially if they believe global warming and all that, why would you want to add another sun? Melting <laughs> at know? some parts of Antarctica yeah. because. Yeah. Yeah. Also, look look how far lighting technology has has come. Um, yeah. For example, Jen and I both have these um, 6,300 lumen flashlights, and when and when you look at the the bulbs in them, the, the LED bulbs, there's almost nothing to them. It, it's crazy. So, when I look at that, and I think of if you had an entire panel of them the size of you know something very large. Uh, and a good power source behind it, you literally could create something like the sun. So I don't think it's far-fetched out of our technology at all. No. Yeah, it's about as big as that screen over there, the one that I've seen, um, hexagon-shaped and, and probably 100 bulbs on it. And you know, I've never seen it turned on, but I've seen the, yeah. the light. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And there's some movie, and Mark's a movie expert, and I always forget titles and quotes of movies. Maybe you remember where there are people and they... Have a, there's a sun simulator and that one doesn't work and they have to go to another area to, to live? Ring a bell? Uh, no. Okay. Sorry. In movies, and oftentimes things in movies have something to do with something that's really happening. Patricia, I think we have time for one more and I'll be right here. Be the last. last question. Hi, friends. My name is Michael. Um, 
I'm sure most can agree that uh, uh, the spell of Hollywood has a big influence on the collective uh, masses. Uh, and being our neighbors across south as opposed to down south. Uh, with Trump pushing out his uh, uh, space force, to me, just uh, proceeding no. with the generation kind of growing up now, seeing these space indoctrination movies, uh, just my speculation, I'm sure there's many agendas, but uh, to me, it's just a military recruitment scam because Absolutely. hey, yeah. they, can, they can never use enough meat shields to any military, whatever country. But I just wanted to know your guys' take of what the uh, Space Force, uh, yeah. which I is bollocks that's, in my opinion. It's a good one to end on. I think you're 100% right. So that's what, what better way to get you know, teenagers and, and college uh, kids to be interested in joining the military so they want to go into the Space Force. Oh, sorry, we, you got to start out here. You gotta, we don't have a place there, but we have somewhere in the Marines or... So I think you're absolutely right. That seems yeah. like it to me. Uh, th that seems to me to be a perpetuation. If, if the Werner von Braun deathbed uh, testimony is true, then you know he said it. It's all based yeah. on a lie. But there's always this, another excuse for space-based weaponry and creating a space force that it's a militarized thing. You know that's what we're talking about. We're, Ronald Reagan's Star Wars, right? From my perspective, biblically speaking. Uh, we see that in the end times, the sky is going to open like a sky dome. <laughs> and it tells you like, that the sky is going to roll away like a scroll. Uh, and that uh, Yeshua is coming back on a horse. And Revelation 19.19 19 says that all the nations of the world have gathered together to make war with the one coming on the horse. So for me, when I look at this whole agenda for space-based weapons, that's what makes the most sense. That they, they're trying to find a way to make war with God, and if we believe we're in the end times, that day may be approaching when the sky dome opens up, and they want to be ready for it. I yeah. read that former astronaut, in quotes, Scott Kelly, said when Trump started talking about space force originally, said it was a quote dumb idea. That's interesting. So they're creating their own opposition with asking Scott Kelly to say that. Another thing might be the alien invasion that you want to have your, even though it's, even though it's fake, you have your fake military yeah. team to, to combat it. And, and that was what Werner von Braun. He said the last card, is the, the last invasion. card is aliens. And remember, it's all a lie. Yeah. Do, do any of us think that the last card will be played in our lifetime? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Probably sooner than we think. Yep. Right. Well, we're aware. So So. so that's it. It's been fun. And we all have a new appreciation for bells. Yeah. So, Jeez. Thanks for putting up with all thanks, of that. Thanks to thanks everybody guys. in Edmonton. You guys were great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Give it up for the panel, guys. Give it up. <laughs> Patricia Steer, Mark Sargent, Jaron Campanella, Rob Skiba, Bob Nodell. Emmanuel Lakanga, Big Matt Long, and of course, the guy that put this all together for us and did a lot of work, and uh, I can tell you this, give credit, give a round of applause to his wife and children first, because that's a lot of work for Rachel and the kids to, to do this, but, oh, there you are, I was looking for you, Robbie Davidson. <laughs>